How's everybody doing? You doing well? Yeah? Real well? Sean, give me a woo. I, I, I just, oh, there we go. Wow, that's what I'm talking about right there. Well, hopefully you guys are all having a great day. Everyone's doing well so far. It's really nice outside, which is awesome. It's great to have you. If you haven't been to Joy Church before, welcome. Uh, we are very, very glad to have you. And if you need anything, please let us know so that we can get you pointed in the right direction. Um, just in case you didn't know this, our joy groups are running right now, and they have announced it, and I think they announced it today, and oftentimes we do, but sometimes it can slip through the cracks, and I'm telling you, our joy groups are a ton of fun. What they are is a, they're a time, an opportunity for people to kind of get together and, and meet, talk about life, talk about what's going on in a, in a setting that's a little bit smaller than uh, church like this on a Sunday morning. And so if you haven't checked one of those out, you should definitely, definitely do that. Uh, you can look at our info center out there and you can see the different types of groups that we have. They meet all over the city. They meet at different times. Um, you can go on our website, joygrantspass.com and check them out there. But I just wanted to put a little plug in there because they are so incredibly vital to our relationships. Anyway, last week we launched into a series about money. Who here likes money? Who here is like, just, sh I'm not even ashamed, just lift your hand up in the air. Yeah, some of you are like, no, no, I'm not about that life. And what are you doing 40 hours a week? Just working that job. No, I'm just joking. The reason that we talked about money, and hopefully you're not the person saying, well, that's so crass. Why would you go into a series on when you're talking about money? Jesus would never talk about something like that. Well, if you crack open that Bible of yours, you'll find out that Jesus talked about money an awful lot. <laughs> he talked about the kingdom of God the most, and his second most common topic that he talked about was money. And I think I know why. <laughs> because it's the thing that we think and talk and organize our lives around a lot. That's why the, the series title that we're, we've been working with is In Blank We Trust, or In Question Mark We Trust. What do we trust in? And Jesus talked about this all the time. Last week, we kind of kicked this off and launched this idea. And the real, the big point, the big takeaway is that money, our money reflects what we believe internally. It reflects it externally, right? Things that we say that we believe, we say that we are, we say that they're a principle in our life. Money is that kind of thing that bridges what we believe inside to what, what, people can actually observe on the outside. And so we're looking at Luke chapter 7, and it's an interesting story. Uh, you know, there's this, this Pharisee, and if you're not familiar with what a Pharisee is, it's somebody who was very, very learned in the Jewish faith, right? These were like the top dogs. These guys were the elite. These guys knew what was going on. They knew all the right answers. They knew all the rules. And Jesus comes into town, and he's doing all these miracles. He's, he's just, his ministry is powerful, and he's seeing things happen, and people are being raised from the dead, and people are being healed, and demons are being cast out. And this Pharisee, who knows all the answers, he invites Jesus over, and Jesus, why don't you come have dinner with me? And so Jesus goes to this guy's house, and they're having dinner. He's reclining at table. Now, that's swag right there. I, I eat dinner. If I reclined at table, whatever that looks like, Danny would tell me to sit up. Uh, my wife, Danny, would tell me, what are you doing? How dare you recline? I'm just going to lay here on the ground if you wouldn't mind feeding me, family. Jesus is reclining at table, right? He's, he's hanging out with this Pharisee. He gets invited, and so he goes. And in comes this, what the Bible calls a sinful woman right? And scholarly consensus believes that this woman was probably most likely a prostitute. And so this is like the most contrast that you can have. You have this super holy, guy's got it all together, Pharisee, and you have this prostitute. And the prostitute, she's not just there, she's actually weeping. Her tears are falling on Jesus' feet. She's wiping them with her hair, and she's pouring perfume that costs the equivalent of a year's wages on his feet. Anybody ever done that before? Like, this is just such an awkward situation. And I'm a fan of awkward things. I love awkward things. Anyone else here like awkward things? You just love awkward situations? I mean, I was going to like show a slide or a, a photo or something here, and I, I can't because I would rabbit trail for the rest of our time today just talking about hilarious, awkward things. But this, this, the picture is just so, imagine your most prim and proper friend and you're like most vulgar, cussing, swearing, you know, no tact, whatever. You're like, I don't know anybody like that. Well, I'm sorry, if, that's, if you don't know anybody like that, here's the secret, it's you. Imagine like <laughs> the most proper person you know and the, the least proper, the least amount of tact, you guys like, Aaron, this sounds like every Thanksgiving dinner. 
And you have this situation where both of these people are in the same place, and this Pharisee is just watching this. Like, first of all, Jesus, how, how do you have this amount of control? Like, what would you do if a stranger came up to you and they started kissing your feet? <laughs> Hopefully you'd go, why are you kissing my feet? <laughs> That's the proper response. <laughs> you know, the proper response isn't like, mind putting some perfume on those bad boys as well? <laughs> mind wiping them down with your hair? It's weird. If you can't look at this scripture and just go, hmm, that's weird, then you're lying. <laughs> that's a weird thing. It's just, it's an awkward, awkward situation. And so you, you have this, this uh, situation where this, this woman, like, uh, and this is what we delved into and, and really drilled down on and looked at last week. If you weren't here and you didn't get to see this, you can look at the, the sermon on the website. That this woman had, had been forgiven so much. Her life had been so broken. Her life had been so bad. She had been so bound in sin. She had seen things. She had done things. And still she recognized who Jesus was. And she gave the very best part of her. The very best that she had. She gave her glory, her hair. She gave her tears, her emotions. She gave this incredibly expensive perfume. And she gave it to what would be perceived as the worst part of Jesus. His feet, they're dusty, they're dirty. And this Pharisee is watching this situation like, what is going on? What is happening? I, I recognize that this might be the Messiah. I recognize that this guy might have the answers that I'm looking for, but I'm really here to get something from him. I want him to, to make my life better in some way. And this sinful woman, was, was not, she did not have that perspective. She was thinking, how can I give the most, the best, everything that I have. I recognize who I am, and I recognize who this guy is and how much I need him. And there's nothing that I'm going to hold back from this guy. Why? Why was it different? They had a different perspective. They had a different perspective. They saw things from a different angle. They, they were after something different. She was after giving, and he was after getting. This Pharisee, he was... He was trying to, uh, uh, you know, pile something in his backpack. He, chances are he was a wealthy guy, and he's watching this. And how many of you, when you look at this story, you go, man, this guy, this guy reminds me of myself in some situations. <laughs> what can Jesus do for me? What can faith do? I'll buy into this thing if it pays me in some way, if it makes my life immediately better, if I get something out of it, if he answers the questions that I want answered. And this woman just was not in that headspace. They have a completely, completely different perspective. And most of us know what perspective is, right? It's kind of your point of view. It's looking at something from a certain angle. It's seeing things a certain way. Can I just explain perspective in a way that I think brings it home even more closely? When I was in Medford, I worked at a, uh, on staff at a church in Medford um, for five or six years, Joy Church Medford, where Joy Church grants pass. Hey, yo. And I had the unfortunate privilege of being on 24-7 security de detail. I know you're looking at me. You're like, you're like, yes, I can see why. You're obviously huge and muscular. No, that's not it. It's that no one else wants to do it. And so 24-7, 24 hours a day. How many of you have worked security before? You have, right, Eric? Oh, hey, Nate dog, what's happening? We got two Nate dogs now. Oh, man, what are we going to do? Security is the kind of thing that you always, you know, you need security for a certain reason, but you don't ever want to have to use it. And so we had this setup where we had this janky old alarm system, and the building was like 35,000 square feet. It was massive, right? Now, if you ever go into a dark building that's 35,000 square feet, do you know where the hiding places are? Everywhere. Everywhere that it's possible to be. Like, I mean, everywhere. So I get a phone call at 3 in the morning, the alarm's calling me, right? And so you're just slammed into consciousness. You're, you're awake. And I had like a special alarm for the alarm system. So it was like, especially like this thing is going to wake you up. And so bam, you wake up, the alarm's going off. S someone's in the church. You don't know what's going on. And so I have to go down there and inspect, right? <laughs> Check out what's going on down here. So, you know, just need to lay the smack down if I, if I have to. <laughs> now, 
I'm just going to admit, no matter how manly you are, when it's 3 a.m., you get woken out of a dead sleep, you go down to the church, it's pitch black, there's scary noises, and you're slinking around. And everything is dark, and everything is, is a hidey hole, and you swivel your flashlight, because that's, that's how, what you have as a security guard. You have a flashlight, just in case. I don't know what it's going to do. And you, you shine the flashlight around, and all the shadows shift, and it looks like everything's moving. And you're just down there like, be strong, be strong, Aaron. So I'm walking through the church, and I go into the, the sanctuary, and it's kind of like this. There's all these pews. And let me show you a photo of what is staring me in the face. Go ahead and put that. Now, <laughs> zoom in on that guy. Go to the next photo. This is... How many of you are actually kind of scared right now? <laughs> You're like, guarantee, 100%, no doubt in my mind, that is going to come alive and it's going to kill me. <laughs> like, you're thinking that right now. It's well lit. You have your friends around. Everything's like, yeah, I don't believe that. If you see this thing at 3 in the morning when you're by yourself and alarm has just gone off, you think, my word, this thing's been running around. It's been waiting for me. It's going to bite me in the neck. I am actually going to turn into a haunted mannequin kind of doll thing myself. Just, it's the creepiest thing you could possibly see at this point in time. And so a few days later, I'm, I, I go, you know what? I am not going to, I'm not going to let this happen again. So I installed a bunch of cameras, right, in the in the, uh, the, throughout the whole building. So if the alarm goes off, I can get on my phone and look around and see if there are any demonic children running around, besides my own demonic children. And let's throw up this next, I was showing my friend and I just happened to jump on at a random time and go ahead and throw on that next. Now, can you see this? <laughs> I added the text, that wasn't on there. I randomly pulled up my phone to show my friend how you could log in and look through photos through the security cameras at, in real time after seeing that baby. Do you see the demon ghost baby? Can you guys see that? Like, I, 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 I tried to play it cool. I was like, hey man, I want to see how these cameras... Oh, 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 it really was a demon ghost baby. Now, this is where perspective comes into view. The next day, with fear and trepidation, I went to the church, and I took a photo of the same exact spot. Go to the next spot. That's what it was. A messy junk pile, because there was a party. The youth had a party the day before, and someone had just thrown all the disco ball and all this, these tablecloths and stuff on a table, and, and, and there's nothing there. <laughs> what? <laughs> You all see the demon ghost baby in the last photo, right? That, that, looks like the, that looks like something from a horror movie. I don't know if the lights are still down or if we can bring those back up. Perspective. I saw something that I thought was, was there. Maybe it was. I still don't know. Why do you think we moved to Grants Pass? <laughs> I saw one thing in the camera that I, I, I got there the next day. Yeah, you should just give me like a five-minute standing ovation that I was brave enough to go down there the next day. <laughs> I wasn't pausing so you'd really do it. But perspective. Now, this is kind of a funny story, obviously. Uh, but this is the point that I'm driving at perspective, the way we see things, the way we view things, influences, it dictates our behavior. It influences how we act. It influences how we think. It influences who we are, the way that we see things. Your perspective dictates your behavior. It dictates the way that you act. Listen to how this plays out in, in Matthew chapter 19. You've probably heard of the rich young ruler before, and we're going to read this account, and I think you'll find that perspective plays such a humongous part in the way that we live, the way that we see money, the way that we see Jesus. Someone came to Jesus. Uh, it's called the rich young ruler in some translations. It says that a, a rich young man or a wealthy young man came to Jesus with this question, teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? That sounds like a pretty good question. 
I, I asked that question. I want to know the answer to that question. But if you don't really read into the language and into the context here, you can miss the fact that when he says, what good deed must I do? The language here actually indicates that he was essentially asking this question. Teacher, Jesus, I've heard about you. I've heard that you've been preaching about the kingdom. You've been preaching about eternal life. Tell me, how do I buy this? What must I do? This is different than what the, the woman who came in, the sinful woman in the story we talked about, she came in and she just started going to town, crying and putting oil and perfume and her hair and all this on Jesus' feet. But this guy comes up and he doesn't start there. He doesn't start at, what, what can I give? How can I get behind you? He goes, Jesus, what must I do? What do I have to do? How much does it cost? How do I buy this thing that I want from you? How can I get something that I want from you? Verse 17, Jesus responds with a question like he does every single time to everybody who asks him a question. Why ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, there is only one who is good. But to answer your question, if you want to receive eternal life, keep the commandments. And Jesus kind of flips the script here. Jesus kind of, he shows how his perspective is just 180 degrees opposite to this guy. So the guy walks up, good teacher. Jesus goes, why are you calling me good? Why are you asking me what is good? There is one who is good. Which is an interesting point that Jesus contrasts the what versus the who. Because this guy is after what can I get from you? What can make my life better? And Jesus, his perspective is not there. Jesus' perspective is always, if there's goodness to be found, it's in a person. It's not a what. It's a who. Why are you even talking this way? Why do you bring this up in this way? Because he's, the rich young ruler is still driving this direction. He has a different perspective. So Jesus says, don't ask me about what's good. Ask me about who's good. If you're not asking, how do I get nearer to a person, as a result of that goodness, you're asking the wrong question. However, keep the commandments. And I think this was a kind of baited hook for this rich young ruler. So in verse 18, he says, which ones? Which ones? Now, if you just motor by that part, it can seem like it's not very significant. But can you imagine what he's asking here? Teacher, I want something you have. There's something that you have that I want very badly. How can I get that? What do I need to pay for it? And Jesus goes, whoa, 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 you're, you're asking the wrong questions. However, keep the commandments. And he goes, well, which ones do I have to keep? What's the bare minimum that I have to do? How can I get the most for the least? How can I get the best deal? How can I get the bargain. How can I get, can I use a promo code on this Jesus? Can I get this for a shade less? Can I apply my online discount? Which ones? How can I get the most for the least? If you don't think this is a big deal, try it next time you're on a date <laughs> or on your anniversary. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I love you, Danny. I was wondering what the least amount of money I could spend in order to keep you just okay with me. <laughs> I don't ask that question, because that number's a lot. <laughs> Danny, it's our anniversary. I thought that we could celebrate by going to the cheapest burger joint in, burger joint in town um, so that I could um, get away with spending the, the smallest amount of money. Like, that's... It's, how many of you ladies are like, don't, don't you even try that? Don't even th you think about that. So my, some of you guys are like, I've been doing that every year. <laughs> he has just a completely different perspective. Jesus, I want this from you. <laughs> What's the least that I have to do to get it? It's the most opposite you could be from the sinful woman. The sinful woman was asking, how, how do I give the most that I have? How do I give the very best part of me? And he's going, which commandments do I need to keep? I mean, as a Jew, you would know that the answer is all of them. All of the commandments. Otherwise, they'd be called the Ten Suggestions. <laughs> he 
you could, <laughs> you could see the rich young ruler. Jesus is like, keep the commandments. And he's like, how do I talk this guy down? It's like a used car salesman. Jesus is. Which ones do I have to keep? Jesus replied, you must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. And he, he starts listing off some of the, the commandments. He lists a representative list, list of the Ten Commandments here. And, and, and so the guy jumps back in, and I, I, I kind of think he interrupted Jesus because Jesus is talking, and, and the rich young ruler in verse 20, he says, yeah, 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 okay, I got it. I've obeyed all of these. I've done these. I've paid this price. Yes, I've done all this from my youth. I get it. What else must I do? What do I have to do? How can I get what I want and go down the road? How can I get what I'm driving after and be done with this conversation? How can you help me to make my life better and my thing better and my agenda better and just tell me the answer that I need so that I can get on with my life? And I, I hate that this is the case, but lots of times this is where we live. The praying that we do is, God, can you save me from this thing that I've got myself into? And the worship that we do is maybe half-hearted, and it's a distraction, and it's, oh, I don't want people to see me really giving like, my guts, this emotional part of me, this, this deepest and best part of my life to my Lord and my Savior. And if he was here, I would be the first one in line to be crying and weeping and pouring precious ointment on his feet. I don't care who sees me. I don't care who knows? I don't care because he saved me from so much. It is worth it. It's more than worth it. So he says, I've, I've obeyed all these commandments. What else must I do? What do I have to do? What's the bare minimum? So in verse 21, Jesus told him, if you want to be perfect, mature, complete, done, if you want to go on to that, if that is what you want, and he goes on, but the rich young ruler wasn't asking this. From the beginning, he wasn't asking, teacher, how do I be perfect? Teacher, how do I be complete? Good teacher, Jesus, how do I be more like you? But Jesus answered him that way. Do you know why? Because he had a different perspective. He's answering the real question. He's answering what really needs to be answered. <laughs> The rich young ruler is asking the wrong question. He's asking the wrong questions because he has a wrong perspective. And very possibly from time to time, you and I have the wrong perspective. And it causes us to ask the wrong questions. And even worse, it causes us to demand the wrong answers. And it's frustrating when God responds to us in the way that is right. But we can't hear it or we can't see it or we can't understand it because we're asking in a way that's wrong. Our perspective is it's broken, it's twisted, it's, it's, it's bent inwards on ourself. Jesus just won't be sucked into this. So he answers based on his perspective. If you want to be perfect, go and sell all of your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Ouch. But when the young man heard this, he went away Sad, for he had many possessions. You ever wonder what the rich young ruler missed out on? Jesus just told him, go, sell your possessions, give it to the, to the poor, and follow me. Like, come with me during my journey, my ministry. Come see what I'm doing. Is it worth it to you? What if he would have said yes? All right, there go the possessions. Let's saddle up and ride, Jesus. Let's do what you're doing. And they go off and, and do their thing. What, what would have been written about him in Scripture? The scariest part to me is maybe Jesus is asking you and me, hey, why don't you stop caring so much about the possessions that you have? Maybe you shouldn't value money to the degree that you do. Maybe what Jesus is asking is that we would follow him. We have to make sure that our response isn't the same as the rich young ruler. I can't do that. I'm sad. That's not going to work for me. I have a lot of stuff. 
And I define the value of my life by that stuff. In 23, Jesus goes on and he kind of wraps it up for his disciples. He says, then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth. It is very hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. I'll say it again. And when Jesus repeats himself, listen up. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now, all sorts of, of study and ideas and extrapolations have been made about what it means for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, and there is no consensus on what it means. What the closest approximation that we have is that means it is very, very difficult. The disciples were astounded. Then who in the world can be saved, they asked. Jesus looked at them intently. <laughs> Whew. I've been looked at intently before. <laughs> but Jesus looked at them intently. The subject was important enough to him that he repeated himself and he looked at intently. Looked at his guys intently. And he, he wrapped up the, the scripture, he wrapped up the end of it. He said, humanly speaking, without God, just on your own, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Jesus' perspective was so much different and probably is so much different than what ours is a lot of the time. The question is, are we living in such a way that we are constantly asking God to adjust his perspective to fit ours? Or are we humble enough, like the sinful woman, to come before him and say, you know what? No matter what it takes, no matter what it costs, Jesus did so much for me. Even if I gave him everything I have for the rest of eternity, it would never be enough to repay the price that he paid on the cross for me. And I'm glad to give whatever I have. That's the question. Just like the story of the Pharisee and the sinful woman, the question isn't, how do I get something from this guy? The question we need to ask ourselves is, why in the world do I not have the same reaction to Jesus that this woman did? That scares me that I live portions of my life where I'm not soft, I'm not broken. I forget the gift that I've been given, that my entire life should be wrapped around the idea of giving Jesus whatever he wants. Luckily and thankfully, he wants me, he wants my heart. And to be honest with you, I believe that God wants to prosper people. He wants people to make money, and it might not sound like it, but I think that he wants to get money to the people he can get money through. I think he wants to do something with our heart so that whether you have money or whether you don't, our, our stock default position is always, Jesus, everything I have is yours, and I'm glad to give it. The word perspective is actually an art term, an artistic term, if you trace its roots back. And what, it, what it, it reflects, what it really was used for originally, in the original language, was when you draw a picture, you paint a picture, you draw different objects, and they have different relations to each other. How many of you have tried to draw something, a landscape before, and it doesn't look like it has any depth, it's just 2D, just shallow, like you can't, like how do you picture a horizon? How do you make the ocean extend out depth-wise? How do you draw anything but stick figures? I don't know, that's all I draw. But in artistic terms, everything has a, a relation from one object to another, from one item to another, and that's what makes it look the way that it does. And so when artists draw or paint or design uh, some sort of scene, some sort of picture or portrait, they draw attention to one portion or another based on the relation of one object to another. And I think this is very interesting because our lives are somewhat of this painting, this artwork, this, this drawing, this message and oftentimes if we do not have our perspective right. 
then oftentimes we're drawing attention away from the object that really deserves to be seen. It deserves to be highlighted. It deserves to be gloried in. It deserves to be enjoyed. And I would suggest that that person, that that artistic figure is Jesus. And when our perspective gets broken, what we do is we start drawing the picture of our life and we occupy the center that greatest place. That's where our attention is drawn, and that's where our eyes are drawn, and that's where our, our time, our resources, our focus, our attention. And when you begin to shift your perspective, you find that just like this woman who was willing to pour out everything that she had and everything that she was, to her, it was worth it. Because everything in her life, she wanted to point to Jesus. The Pharisee didn't want that. He wanted everything in his life to point to himself. And unfortunately, oftentimes without us thinking about it, just purely on accident, just without a a, a deliberate effort, we end up doing the same thing. The the portrait of our life points at ourselves. And it's all about what can I get and what can I do for myself? And if, if Jesus is really there, how can he help me? And how can he make my life better? And how do I just kind of sneak into heaven? And I just don't think there's that kind of sneaking going on. I don't think God's going to be like, whoa, how'd you get here? Surprise me. Man, you seemed like you were awful. Whew, must have just barely made it last second. That's never how Jesus responded to people. They always came up with questions and he's like, oh, the answer is easy. All you got to do is... Die to yourself. Pick up this cross, this instrument of death, and trust me that the life that you're going to find in me is the real life that you need. Trust me that there's rivers of living water that will come out of you, that that you actually are dead in your sins and your trespasses right now until you, you die to yourself, go through the waters of baptism, and actually arise with newness of life. That was his perspective then, and that's his perspective now. And you might be here today, and you're thinking, wow, I, I didn't know that, that, that that's how Jesus thought. I didn't know that he was calling me into something like that, and, and he is. No matter who you are, or where you came from, or what your background is, or what you did last night, God wants a relationship with you. God wants to be near you. He wants you to be near him. He wants you to be part of of his family. And you may have never heard that idea before. That might be completely foreign to you. You might think, wow, well, I I thought that if I just acted a certain way and if I just kind of kept some rules and kind of played by the by the book, then then at the end of the age, God would just be like, okay, well, yeah, they they did all right, so let's let them in. And really what scripture portrays over and over the gospel message is that even if we try to play by the book, even if we try to do everything right and dot all the I's and cross all the T's and play by the rules, even that we fail. And apart from that, even if we were able to do that, the Bible says that all of the righteousness that we can manufacture is as filthy rags before a holy God. It's even a prideful notion that we think that just by acting a little bit better than God is somehow obligated to cause us to be sons and daughters. The message of grace and the message of the cross is not that just that we can act a little bit better and think a little bit better. The message of the cross is that we need to be radically transformed and changed from one type of person into another type of person, a new creation. And when you accept that, when you say, God, I've tried it my way, I've tried doing it the way that I think is best over and over and over, and at the end of the day, I find out that I I still am me. I still am in need of a Savior. When you find Jesus in the way that this woman found Jesus, you go, my word, money, attention on myself, my own swag, my own whatever. Looking back in hindsight, we can see the Pharisee and we go, what's your problem, dude? Why didn't you see this sinful woman and see what was taking place and jump on board? This is, this is where you need to live too. 
And if you're here and you say, you know what? I know that I'm in need of a savior. I know that I, I'm hopeless without God. I know that anything I try ends up in heartbreak and failure unless God comes into my life and he changes the person that I am that his spirit would come and live in me, whatever that means, that he would be willing to walk with me and journey with me and that Jesus would come and become the who in my life and not the what. The person that would walk with me closer than a brother, the person that would be willing to be around the person that I am and help me work through things and get them figured out and transform my heart. If that's you, I'd invite you to pray this prayer with me. Just repeat after me. Dear Jesus, you are who you say you are. I'm not after the what. I'm after the who. God, I want you. I know who I am. And I know what I've done. And I repent. I turn away from my sin. And the darkness. And the brokenness. And I'm willing to change. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your blood. Jesus, thank you that you would take my sin. You would become my sin so that I could become right in your eyes. Make me live. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm just going to pray for the rest of you real quick. God, thank you so much that you care about our lives, that you care about the big things and the small things. And God, as we study what your word says about money and possessions, God, I pray that we'll begin to see from your perspective that we won't just judge the value of our lives based on what we can get and what we can spend and how we look and how we feel. But God, the basis of how we judge the value of our lives will always be what you did for us and what you do for us and who you are. God, let our lives reflect your prosperity, your abundance, and your willingness to give because you're a generous God and you gave the best of what you had to us and we want to reflect that and give the best of what we have to you. Father, we love you and we trust you. In Jesus' name, amen.